My cat saved my life twice from something. I knew it was him from the cologne. It was always the cheap mall kiosk stuff. He swore you couldn't tell the difference. I never had the heart to tell him he was wrong. It was about three in the morning when I felt him get into bed with me. The king we used to share felt empty without him. I felt the bed shift. I felt someone nuzzle up close to me. I swear I heard him whisper into my ear, Hey baby, he cooed. I'm here now. I rolled over to kiss him. I needed this. Of course, there was nobody there. Jack had died three months ago in this apartment of a drug overdose. We met in our early 20s, me being a fresh young gay on Grinder, newly out of the closet and wondering why so many people wanted to party. Entered Jack, someone who had spent his time and left said party. He was more versed than me in life experience by a mile. Homeless at 16 by parents who wouldn't accept him, Jack fell into what most kicked out gays do, a life of drugs and alcohol. He grew up fast, grew up hard, and was exposed to things a kid his age shouldn't have been. I'm not making excuses. He made a lot of bad choices, too. A jail stint and court-ordered rehab set him straight, thankfully. Things were good, or so I had thought. Six months ago, I noticed changes in him. He was run down, tired. He repeatedly said he couldn't sleep and had nightmares. I thought he was overworked. He had found himself a great construction gig and was fond of overtime. It helped keep his head on straight, he'd say. Three months ago, I came back to our apartment to find him slouched over on our couch. His face was contorted into a scene of painful shock. I panicked. I don't know what happened next. My memories just flash a bit, like a slideshow after this. 911 was called. The doctors and coroners were stumped. All signs point to a heart attack. I overheard one EMT say sourly after I divulged Jack's drug history that the drug use finally caught up with him. True or not, I almost punched her in the face. Time stopped for me after that for a while. I had to put on the funeral. It was a lot for me. I felt like I was covered in molasses. I don't remember how it went. I think it was a small turnout, mostly co-workers, all very sympathetic, of course. I can't remember much of that first month. I was too deep in my grief. I was struck with a fever twice. I could barely get out of bed. I'm sure it was a combination of the depression as well. That month was brutal. I couldn't find a reason to get out of bed most days. I started snapping out of it when the noises started. Bumps in the middle night, shuffling, doors closing and opening, footsteps. I wasn't sleeping most nights. I couldn't. The noises occurred with too much frequency to give me a respite. I thought I was going crazy until the night the bathroom faucet turned on. I shuffled out of the bed, groggy and half asleep. I got to the closed bathroom door and tried to open it. Locked. The light was on and something was casting a shadow. I knock. Clear as day, I hear Jack's voice. Hold on, babe. I'm almost done. I slam the door open. His toothbrush falls from midair to the ground. The sink turns off. There's a large thump behind me. I didn't sleep that night. Noises continued whispers. A few nights later is when he climbs into bed with me. I haven't told anyone about that yet. What would they say? It's grief. It will pass. You still feel him around you. I didn't want to hear that bullshit. I knew what I felt. He was in bed with me. The dreams came next, and that should have been my first warning in retrospect. They were so beautiful. Could you fault me? Put yourself in my shoes. They started out as memories of the good times he and I had together. The first date at a bowling alley. The first kiss at the drive-in theater. The times he knew I would hold dear to me. They were incredibly vivid. Then he started addressing me. First briefly, not much. Just vague feelings or concepts of conversations we had in those memories. Talking about the tiny things you never knew you'd miss. Talking about, like corn dogs from a county fair. I wasn't sure whether or not those conversations happened. They were always foggy memories of the best times but they got increasingly more and more specific. Sleep got worse. If it wasn't Jack visiting my dreams, it was the noises he'd create at night. I began to feel ill again. One night, he came to me in a dream. He took my hand, looked me in the eye, and began to cry. God, I've missed you, he sobbed. It was the first time he seemed to acknowledge what happened. He leaned in, kissed me gently on the lips. He hugged me, and that cheap, familiar cologne scent filled my nostrils. I felt a tear go down my cheek. I missed this. 
He leaned closed and I felt his breath in my ear as he whispered the words that snapped me awake. You should come with me. I woke up in a cold sweat. I could taste his lips on mine. The words and implications still lingered in my mind. I loved him. I was young and naive, sure, but he was my first. You remember that kind of love, right? I know now that life goes on, but during that time, for reasons I find out later, his words grabbed me. What was so good about being without him anyway? The noises persisted. He kept visiting, asking again for me to join him, the request getting heavier and heavier to ignore. I wanted to ask about what he meant, but I couldn't, or I guess didn't need to. I knew what it meant. I didn't want to admit it to myself at the time that it was a possibility. I barely slept. When I did, I wasn't rested. I felt like the walking dead already. Is that why I'm seeing Jack everywhere? I didn't tell anyone about it. I didn't want to hear their conventional wisdom bullshit about grief. The thing that concerned me the most was the sleepwalking. I never did it in the 32 years of my life, and suddenly it starts when my dead boyfriend decides to visit. Go figure. I'd wake up in precarious positions, never in deadly danger, but just enough where a wrong turn or a fall would break an arm. Things escalated one night. I would have died had it not been for gravy. Jack was in my dreams again where we're at the county fair. We were holding hands and staring dumbfounded in different ways at the rides put up the night before. Jack had always loved them. I think it helped speak to a bit of the risk taker in him. He loved theme parks and roller coasters to death. I wouldn't dare. I was a notorious scaredy cat. He asked me why I wasn't smiling like I used to. He knew the answer. I know you're tired and scared, he said, rubbing my hand with both of his. But I need you to answer soon. I don't know much longer I can visit like this. It didn't occur to me that he may be doing this on borrowed time. My eyes land on the tilt-a-whirl nearby, and he clocks this. His face lights up. Please, I don't know how much longer I'm here, he asked between yanking my hand towards the ride. Give me this. Just this. Please. It's not that scary, I think. I feel a yank on my hand, and I take a step forward. I feel something dart between my legs and the next thing I know I'm face-planting in the street in the middle of night. I roll over, dazed, and my eyes turn to my savior. Not only three feet away was a small gray cat with specks of black all over him. He had what looked like a slightly torn right ear and let out what could have been the deepest meow I think I've ever heard from a cat. It sounded like the guy smoked a pack a day. He was thin, but not deathly thin. He either had a neighborhood route of friends to feed him or was an adept hunter. I heard the honk and instantly got out of the street just in time for a minivan to barrel down the road. I stared dumbfounded, registering the chain of events. I clearly slept walk into danger. This is bad. Did Jack lead me here? I felt my head get dizzy. The ball of fur that saved my life rubbed itself on my legs, purring. It snapped me back to reality. I looked down at him and he looked back at me expectedly. It was 3 a.m. I was tired. Everything felt heavy, but I looked down at this guy, and I knew not to fight it. I walked back to my place, and sure as a shit, he followed, meowing loudly in what sounded suspiciously cranky at the same time. I walked inside, and he followed instantly. I have a cat now. This is how these things happen. I've heard of the cat distribution system. In the dark of it all, I had a light, and his name was Gravy. He looked like Gravy. Your pet name isn't any better. He was healthy as far as I could tell. Neutered already, which meant he had experience with people, good or bad. He was skittish, but I knew that was to be expected. It's not my first cat rodeo. I had him set up with the proper kit within the next few days and his shots scheduled. Curiously, the one spot he reacted the most negatively to was the spot where Jack had died. He got on his haunches and hissed, but let it be. My brain didn't register the possibility as to why until later. Gravy was the thing that kept me going. He gave me a reason. He was just the right mixture of affectionate and cranky aloofness I needed in a cat. I needed gravy because Jack wouldn't let up. The dreams took a more urgent tone. The first time he returned, I told him of my accident, and he swore he didn't do anything. He said that his time was limited. I had to make my decision because he's getting pulled away somewhere, he claimed. We wouldn't be together unless I left with him before he got pulled. Nobody would love you like me. The noises got more frequent and violent. 
Gravy saved my sanity during those times. He'd register and clock them too, often reacting with a hiss and a growl and some curiosity. The noises were loud. Plates would shatter against the wall often. I didn't give a damn about setting up cameras to capture it. People would say I'm faking it anyways. The dreams got worse. The color would fade, and Jack would appear with much more urgency each time. Sometimes, his face was slightly off, like his skin was stretched just a little too tight. The smell of his cologne became tinged with dirt and soil. He would exclaim, frightened, how his time was up. He could make it quick. He could help end things painlessly, he promised. I couldn't answer. I later came to realize that if you're asked point blank if you want to die or not, and you can't answer, you don't want to die. He paced in front of me, clearly agitated. This was the first time I've ever seen this version of him angry. It frightened me. I felt myself get warm. You chose a cat over me, he yelled. He took a few aggressive steps forward and grabbed my shoulders. I screamed. His hands burned my shoulders to the touch. He came close to my face and saw bits of bone exposed by his too tight facial skin. His breath made me gag. You will come with me. His jaw unhinged as if to swallow me whole and I woke up screaming. I didn't startle Gravy who was watching the side of the room, growling. His fur was up. He hissed at something, but I couldn't see what. I felt a wave of tiredness hit me like a brick and I fell asleep again. The second I closed my eyes, there's the smell. It's his cologne. I was dreaming. I knew it, but this wasn't like the others. The color was back. Things felt like the way they were supposed to be, not some strange hellscape uncanny valley. I was in a version of our bedroom from our earlier days, asleep. I was in bed, facing the wall, when I heard the door open. I felt the bed shift, much more weight than it'd be if it were gravy. I felt fingertips along my back. His touch didn't burn like it did before. It felt electric. I got goosebumps. He breathed on the back of my neck and the hairs stood up. He lightly nibbled my ear. I knew in my heart that this wasn't real. I didn't care. I hadn't been touched since Jack. You don't realize how starved you are for touch until you got a plate of food in front of you. I pressed my back against him and I heard him laugh. He rolled on top of me and smiled. He was just as beautiful as the day I met him. He leaned down to kiss with me such a passion I've never experienced. It took me by surprise how much I needed this moment. Maybe he was right. I felt the pressure in my temples. I felt my lungs begin to struggle as he forced his tongue down my throat. Part of me was screaming to fight back. It was drowned out by just how good it felt to be touched by him. It was comforting. My body began to spasm. I looked Jack in the eyes and saw that his pupils had turned jet black. I felt his tongue begin to swell in my throat as air became harder and harder to acquire. A long, guttural growl cut through the dream like a knife. A hiss. I felt Jack's weight shift. I heard him scream. Instantly, I snapped back awake. I was back in my normal bedroom, awake, still with something on me, but I'm not sure what. I couldn't register or understand what Gravy was doing floating on top of me. He was attacking something. That much was clear. He bit down hard on something, which roared out in pain. Flecks of brown ooze or liquid seemed to splash out of the bite wounds. Gravy was inflicting on it. Something connected with my jaw. It felt like a sledgehammer, and I fell off the bed and stumbled back up against the wall. I couldn't process what I was seeing. Gravy was clearly still attached to and attacking something in mid-air that clearly took up space, but I couldn't see it fully. He growled. I noticed some cuts on Gravy's stomach. Suddenly, Gravy was flung up against the wall and I felt something cold and very strong grasp my neck and squeeze. Without missing a beat, Gravy was suddenly on the thing again. The grip let up on my neck and I gasped out for air. I heard a yowl and suddenly Gravy was flung against the wall and held there. He thrashed out but was stuck. Something was holding him. It was squeezing him to death. Whatever holding him was growing more and more visible from the cuts and gashes Gravy had been inflicting on it. Whatever illusions I had faded, Jack was killing my cat, and I was next. I felt a stream of urine go down my leg. I started to get dizzy. In that instant, Gravy made eye contact with me. His face became very strained, focused, and he meowed twice, and that snapped me into action. I thought about it later. I know this sounds crazy, but I know what I heard. Gravy spoke and said two words. Not. 
Jack. Fight kicked in. I had little in the way of weapons, till my eyes fell upon a framed photo of Jack and I kept on my nightstand. I lunge for it and bring it down on my nightstand, shattering the glass cover. I grab the largest shard without even thinking, not registering the horrible cut I had until later. I lunge for the space between Gravy and me and jab the shard of glass into the air. It connects with a wet thud, spurting that same brown liquid into the air. Gravy falls to the ground. More bits of whatever was harassing us slowly begin to take form from the shard of glass until it becomes completely revealed. Whatever fight is in me absolutely flees at the rotting corpse in front of me. Dressed in the rotting clothes I buried Jack in, he growled at me. His dead black eyes rolled around lifelessly in his skull. My eyes began to water at the smell and this thing laughed at me, wheezing. It held the shard of glass in its hand, covered in its own ooze and swiped at me. I held my forearm up just in time to catch the cut. Neither had noticed Gravy reposition himself between us. Completely visible now, the jack thing lunged at me again. Before it could finish its swing, Gravy was on its throat. The force of the tackle took it by surprise, and it stumbled backward. Gravy tore and gnashed at the thing's throat, coating himself in the same gunk that poured out of it. Its rotting hands grabbed at Gravy to pull him away, but Gravy held strong. I didn't hesitate this time. I tore the shard of glass away from the thing and shoved it down the other side of its throat, back and forth. I felt the fire burn in my hand from the cuts of holding it tight, but adrenaline kicked in. I didn't care. All I cared about was working on the other side of this monster's neck while my cat got the other. The thing struggled, but it we had the upper hand. I hacked away at rotting muscle and flesh until finally I felt it was good enough. I stood up and positioned myself above the thing and grabbed onto its temples. Any resemblance of Jack was gone. It was just a rotting mess of flesh now, roaring in pain. I didn't know if it'd work, but it felt right. I planted my knees on his shoulders and pulled its head away from his body with as much force as I could muster. It didn't require much force at all and I overcompensated, landing on my butt against my nightstand, the lifeless head of the rotting corpse still in my hands. The thing's body thrashed less and less before it stopped. I held the head in my hands, feeling the activity slowly begin to die inside it too. I felt the familiar fur and purr against my legs as gravy nuzzled against me. Good boy, I said. I dropped the head on the ground. I should have been surprised when it slowly turned to ash and began to crumble, but I don't think much would have surprised me anymore. The body slowly followed suit. I eyed Gravy, and then my own hand, and promptly decided on the hospital for both of us. Gravy required multiple stitches. I told the vets he protected me from a wild animal. Technically, I don't think I was wrong. He was bruised and beat up, but must have been a fighter, the vet claimed. She had no idea. I required stitches as well. My hands and forearms were pretty sliced up. I eagerly showed my stitches to Gravy the second I could. I'd like to think there was a bit of camaraderie there. He sniffed them and promptly showed me his butt and took a nap. I slept like a rock the night after. Any sort of physical unwellness was gone. The apartment was quiet, but I couldn't stay. Of course I couldn't. I had to move on. I couldn't hold on hope that there's even a fraction of Jack left. We moved out shortly after. One ghost was enough. Was it even a ghost? Did Gravy know I was in danger? Did he come to me specifically? Did I really hear Gravy speak English to me that night? I sat down and asked him. As crazy as it sounded, I sat Gravy on the kitchen table and I asked him if he said not Jack that night. The air stunk. He farted and hopped off the table. I left it at that. I know I feel safer with him around. This dumb, cranky ball of fur saved my life twice. I did some research after that. I didn't realize that cats essentially domesticated themselves. I had known about how various cultures had cherished them as magical creatures, but pulling themselves out of the food chain by getting domesticated is crazy to me. Unless they did it to protect us from things they can see that we can't. I don't like to think about it. I also don't like to think about the one door in my hallway Gravy always stops to hiss at when we come back from our walks. The neighbor who lives there is a female college student who lives alone, whom I've heard sobbing with surprising intensity often, to the point where I've idly wondered if something was wrong. Something felt wrong. 
I didn't want to admit it. I don't like to think about the rapid, familiar thumping I hear from her apartment sometimes. I don't like to think about this time Gravy stopped at the door and looked up at me to ask me with his eyes, Hey, we doing this or what? I took a step away from the door, but Gravy held firm. I eyed him. Nobody will believe me. But this sly bastard nodded at me. I took a deep breath, rolled my eyes, and knocked. Are you okay? Do you need help? 